And our thoughts for this morning deal uh, really specifically with uh, the challenge to be a witness, reasons that we ought to be uh, a witness for the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 24, Proverbs 24, verse number 10, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart considereth it, consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? You know, God's plan of evangelism, um, it's quite simple um, in that he takes those that are, that are his servants and he sends them to do his work. Of course, those that are his servants were not always his servants. Um, those, um, those that are his servants, those that are his friends, uh, were once his enemies, were once lost. And by the message that came to them, they've trusted Christ. They've looked to him by faith. They've been saved. They've been redeemed. And then those, uh, in turn, go out and continue that work, right? That is the work that is continued from generation to generation from the time, um, uh, from time past. Uh, the Lord uses converted sinners to tell other sinners about him. In thinking about being a witness, I want to start with the, the, the book of Isaiah chapter 43. And really, first of course, just take a brief thought about what it means to be a witness. And that is a word that we use um, when we talk about our responsibility as Christians. Um, and we use that. Well, let's read our text here. Isaiah chapter 43, verse number one. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee, and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Even every one that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say it is truth. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. That ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. And we'll quit there. Obviously, a witness is someone who is called in to declare what they have seen. Um, that, that's, that's the general term. We often think of that in light of, you know, testifying in like a courtroom scene or something like that. Uh, when you are called to be a witness, you are called to verify and to tell, yes, this is what I have seen. Uh, and you declare that, um, you know, or, you know, when we also think about uh, a witness being called, maybe not necessarily someone who saw something, but someone who is an expert in a particular field, right? Uh, in, in, a, in a trial, you could have um, maybe a doctor or, uh, you know, some other kind of criminologist or, or, or officer of the law or something come in and give what they call expert witness or expert testimony. And in doing so, they're not necessarily declaring so much what they have seen in a particular instance, but they are declaring what they have seen as a general practice overall, right? Their experience in the field, their understanding of, of, uh, of that subject matter declares them fit and able to be a witness in a particular case. And, you know, as Christians, that is, that is what we are. We are witnesses to something that um, 
has happened. Maybe not necessarily, you know, we weren't witnesses to see uh, Jesus Christ die on the cross, be buried, raise again. Now, there were witnesses that saw that. Um, now, we are witnesses in another way, kind of perhaps, uh, in that we carry on that message, but we do declare uh, what we have seen. We do declare what has happened to us. We do declare that that subject with which we ought to be familiar. Christians ought to be subject matter experts, right? Christians ought to be experts in a particular field. That field is the Word of God. When we share it, when we tell it, uh, our testimony should be that we are experts in this, that we have of knowledge, that we have of a familiar understanding with God's word. That way, when we speak it or when we tell it, we could be considered a trustworthy witness. Turn to the book of Matthew chapter 11. Again, that is specifically uh, and generally what we think of when we talk about being a witness. Someone who tells, someone who declares either that which they have seen or that which they expressly know about. And that's what we are as Christians. We are declaring what we have seen. We are declaring what has happened to us. We are declaring that which we are um, sure of, persuaded of. Um, and that is a great, um, that's a great help, right? With, you know, some of the, uh, some of the objections to being a witness. You know, one, one of the major objections maybe that folks would say to being a witness is that, well, I just don't know what to say. Right. I I get confused. I, I don't understand. I, I get nervous and, and I just don't know what to tell people in the book of Matthew, chapter 11. And I don't want to discount that at all. Um, I know that there are some folks that just by their own personality, their own style, they're nervous in a, in a confrontational setting like that. Um, but we are encouraged that when a witness is called, what they are called to do is just to declare and to say what they have seen. You know, a witness does not have to have every answer for every potential question that would come up through the trial. They are simply going to be asked, what have you seen? What can you testify about? What, you know, what, what can you tell us? In Matthew 11, it says here in verse 1, It came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. When John said, you know, when John from prison questioned, you know, is, you know, you go ask him, is he the one, am I, are we supposed to be looking for another? Jesus says, go tell John what? Tell John what you've seen. Go tell John what you've heard. And then he says, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Now, interestingly enough, when they would go and tell John that, John would be familiar enough with the scriptures to know that that's a direct fulfillment of a prophecy that's given in the Old Testament, right? About the blind, about the lame, about the poor, having the gospel preached unto them. But Jesus, when he tells them this, he tells them in light of, you've seen these things, though. You have heard these things. Go and tell John those things. Our encouragement to people that maybe struggle with, uh, with talking with folks, being a witness because, well, I don't know what to say, and I'm not prepared to answer every question. Um, you know, we want, to encourage, we want to encourage folks like that, right? You don't have to be um, an expert in all topics, doctrinal, scientific, historical, any of those things to be a witness, right? Um, you don't have to be an expert in the creation-evolution debate to talk to people about Christ, to tell people about salvation, to tell them what's happened to you, to tell them what you've seen, to tell them what you know of from the scriptures. You don't have to be able to answer every single doctrinal debate that is out there. That's not what we consider part of being a witness. 
Hopefully, as people grow in the scriptures, right, some of those answers come along later and they uh, become more versed and able to defend. But that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about being a witness. When we're talking about being a witness of salvation, being a witness of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So very basically, again, when we talk about being a witness, that's what we're talking about. Someone who is declaring what they've seen, what they've heard, what they know. And that's what we are called to be. Um, so let's give some basic reasons here why we know that we ought to be a witness. In the book of Mark chapter 16, and we'll start with the most basic one, is that we know we are told to be. You know, if you, if you, can't, if you can't think of any other good reason to do something, um, knowing that you've been told to do it should really suffice as the reason. Um, when I tell the kids to do something, my hope is not necessarily that they are looking around, you know, do I, have real, do I really have a good reason to do this? You know, if I've said, hey, I want you to do this, you need to do this, I don't want them to walk away judging my command on, on, on what they think its merits are, right? Should I really do this? Uh, in Mark chapter 16, of course, verse 15 tells us, Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, in, no one would be able to deny that that's what we've been called by Christ to do and to be is a witness. We are told by Jesus that we are salt and that we are light. We are the light of the world. And a city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Uh, that which we speak, that which we preach, that testimony with which we live uh, ought to be open, ought to be shared, ought to be visible by all those that are around us. We are told to go and to be a witness, to go and to preach the gospel. Um, and that's, that should be sufficient. Now, we have great other reasons to do so. But if, if anybody would judge the merit of those other reasons, or maybe they don't see the other reasons in light of the same way I do. Regardless, each Christian has been called and ordered, commanded, to be a witness, to preach the gospel to those that are around them. Uh, if we are not, of course, we want to be right with the Lord. Of course, to be right with the Lord, you have to obey. And to obey the Lord is to be a witness, is to be someone who shares um, with others. We read some of these verses a little bit uh, in previous weeks, but let's turn back to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel in chapter 33. Okay. So one good reason to do so is that, that subject of obedience, right? That we have been commanded to. That's another good thing to think of in light of some of the excuses or maybe some of the reasons folks struggle or don't want to witness, right? Um, of course, like we looked at in light of the first point, you know, maybe folks feel, well, I don't know what to say. I don't know what I would tell people. I don't feel like an expert. I don't feel like I can do that. Um, some folks, um, one of the reasons maybe that they would use for not going, for not doing, for not telling others is that, you know, well, I just, I just don't know how effective it is. I just, I've done it before. I don't see very many results. I don't feel like I've accomplished very much. Um, and so they, they kind of tend to shy away from it, or maybe they don't have the zeal for it with which they once did. Um, well, we're commanded to do so. We're commanded to go out and to share the gospel. We're commanded to be witnesses. We're not commanded to... Um, to make it effectual. We're not commanded to make it believe. You know, a, a witness um, is there on tr in the trial. They sit in the box to answer the questions, to tell what they have seen. Okay? They are not the jury. You know, they are not the judge. They are there to declare what they have seen and what they have heard. Um, so if folks are worried about results, you know, we don't, we don't go, we are not intending to go as witnesses just with the intent. Well, you know, we want to grow a really, really big place here. You know, we want Wheatfield Baptist Church someday to have 400 people. And because we want to have 400 people, that's why we go and we talk to folks and we reach them in the community, right? 
that's, that's not the goal, right? That's not the motive. Um, our motive first is to be obedient to Christ, to be submissive to what he's commanded us to do. He's the one that has saved us. He's the one that has changed our life. He is the one that has owed all of our loyalty and obedience. And our desire to reach folks is in light of what he has done for us. If Christ has changed our lives, we know and we trust that he can do the same for others. Our end result is not um, a, another person in the pew, another person that can contribute to the offering, another person that can contribute to, to our status, right, as, as a big church. We, first of all, we want to be obedient, okay? That is the goal. That's the first motive. Secondly, um, maybe even as a subheading to that, not only are we commanded to, but we are responsible to do so. And we read this passage a, a few weeks ago, but everyone would be familiar with Ezekiel here in the passage where he speaks about being a watchman, someone who was set on the wall to declare, someone who was set on the wall to warn as they would sit and perched on the wall and they would be able to see from a distance when, when the enemy would come, when someone was um, near to attack, he could sound the alarm, right? He could sound the horn. And in doing so, because he's perched up there on the wall and because he could see from a great distance, his warning would give people time to prepare, right? Either they could, you know, muster their defenses, get the army ready to go out and meet the challenge, or, um, you know, if, if he could see from a distance, you know, man, this, this is a great army, maybe we need to prepare for retreat, for what, whatever it is. His place and his warning gave people opportunity to hear and to prepare. Now, in, in this, it says in Ezekiel 33, verse 7, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at thy mouth and warn them from me. The word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. When it comes down, you know, the early part of the chapter, we understand the imagery of the watchman is set up. And the Lord is able to tell Ezekiel, see, that's what I have done for you when it, con when it concerns the souls of people. When it concerns the hearing of my word, you know, you have been set in a place where you tell people the things that I have said. Now, if they take, if they don't take heed, uh, there are two reasons why someone may not take heed, right? Maybe they didn't know. Well, the Lord says, if they don't know, that's on you because I've given you the word. I've told you to do so. So if they don't take heed and they can say, well, I didn't know. If you haven't told them, he says in verse number eight, um, his blood will I require at thine hand. The, the troublesome part with thinking about that in the spiritual realm is that none of us know what that means, right? Um, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 26, Paul used a familiar phrase. Because he said, wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Right? It, it's obvious that he's using the same analogy, right? Um, none of us could really be for sure. What does that mean, right? Um, we feel a great and should feel a great debt of responsibility when it comes to being a witness and preaching the gospel. Paul says that I'm a debtor, right? Both to the Jews and to the barbarians in Romans chapter 1. He felt a great burden of responsibility to preach and to share. Obviously, there's the command aspect of that. We have been told to do so. But in knowing so, there, there's an additional burden that, that knows, you know what? I, if I don't tell them, you know, what responsibility then bears on my shoulders? And I don't know that. I, I don't know the answer to that, right? I, I don't know... Um, you know, when we stand before the Lord someday and we give an account for those things that we've done in the body since we have been saved, whether they be good, whether they be evil, 
And, we, and, and maybe we are approached with those opportunities that we neglected or that we passed over. Um, that, that's a great burden to think about. Um, that responsibility should weigh so heavily on us that it motivates us to, to be, be a good witness. You know, sometimes, sometimes folks handle responsibility and the burdens of responsibility in different ways. Um, you know, like, like at work, right? Some, someone may have, you know, 50 things to do and, and, or <laughs> they've got just so much to do. They don't have any idea where to get started. They have so many responsibilities, so much to do. They don't know where to get started. So they just don't do anything, right? They just kind of stagnate, you know, they just kind of sit there and spin their wheels. Um, responsibility ought to be a motivator, okay? responsibility should not just be something that causes us to slog in despair. You know, oh, you know, man, this is a great responsibility. I, I, I don't know what I'd do if I mess this up. Or, man, I've got, I've got such a great burden of responsibility, but I don't even know. No, responsibility should be a great motivator. You know what, man, you know what? The Lord has commanded me to do this. I know that I am responsible to do this. Therefore, I want to get out there and give it all my effort to do the best that I can. And so Ezekiel, as a watchman, knows what his responsibility is, right? You, they, he gave me the word, and I have to go out and I have to share that. Um, now, there's potential. The Lord recognizes it here. You, you share the word. You give the message that I gave you. If some hear it, great. If some don't hear it, um, that's not great. But the Lord would, be, would look at Ezekiel and say, you, but you told them. And that is the important part for us, is to know that we have told folks and shared the gospel with them. How about Mark chapter 8? Mark chapter 8, another reason that we know we ought to be a witness is the value of human souls. We, we are in, uh, when we talk about witnessing, we talk about sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with folks, we are talking about something that doesn't just matter their current, their current standing, right? This is not something that will affect them for the next five to ten years. This is not about establishing a, a, a limited temporal you know, status for someone. We are talking about their soul, something that has eternally great value. In Mark 8, verse 36 and 37, familiar verses where he says, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for? for his soul. Now, obviously those are rhetorical questions. He is not asking for a dollar value, right? There, there is no dollar value that you can place on somebody's soul. The, the value of a human soul is, is infinite because it's eternal. You know, anything in this world that you could put a dollar value on, it, it's, it's limited anyway, right? It's temporary. So is the money that you would put on it. Um, when you talk about a soul, though, you're talking about something from the moment that it's conceived, from the moment that it is created, it now has an eternity, right? The, think about that. There is never a time, anybody that's alive, the 7 billion people that are on the world right now, those that have come before, those that will come after, there from that point that they are conceived and brought into this world, there is never a time after that where they will not exist, there will never be a time where they cease to exist. Um, that, that is an infinitely great value that we should place on their life, on their soul, for it's eternal. I look at it in comparison of, of some of the issues that we face nowadays, right? You think about the, the battle that we, we fight with abortion, and, and, and we hate that, and we despise that. You know, one of the reasons that we give for why we despise it is because it looks to us like people are devaluing human life. We know the value of human life. We know that every 
child, every person that is created in the image of God is precious. And therefore, something like uh, abortion is just uh, abhorrent to us. We, we, we hate that. It devalues human life. But what about the Christian that doesn't witness to people? You know, we know the value of an eternal soul is infinitely great. There is nothing that you could give in comparison to it, right? Man, isn't that a good reason to witness to folks? Isn't that a good reason to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ? Is because they have a soul and it's going to go somewhere forever, for eternity. It will never cease to exist. We value life. We should love and value souls. Isn't that why we pity and we just look at the end, you know, like when we read the book of Jonah? And we read the end of that book, and it gets almost discouraging again, right? And we just kind of pity him as, as somebody who didn't care really about the souls of the people that he preached to in Nineveh. Now, after the rough episode at the beginning, Jonah submitted himself, humbled himself. He went to Nineveh and fulfilled his responsibility to preach to them. Jonah really didn't care whether or not those people got saved or not. He actually sat on a hillside waiting, hoping that God would judge them. And we look at that story, and man, that's pitiful. It's just really, really a sad commentary. Um, we should love and value human souls. The thought that one soul could come to know Christ through our witness to them is a thought that should bring such joy to us that we might be able to make a difference in someone that, that is eternal, that will live and exist forever. Now in Mark chapter 9, again, the, the sub point to that or the subheading, um, when we talk about the value of souls and their eternity, um, would be the eternity of perdition as well, right? Um, in Mark chapter 9, verse 44, 46, 48, in this one context, he mentions the same thing three times. And it's speaking about the unending, the unending torments, right? The, the eternal perdition that, that a soul faces in hell. Mark 9, verse 44, 46, and 48. The, the thought that, that perdition or that hell lasts forever is, is almost unbearable even to think about. Um, let's just, you know, if you can imagine a scenario where, where hell lasted a thousand years, that would be unbearable, right? That would be torment to think of all the Bible says about those torments and to think that somebody would have to endure that for a thousand years. But you and I both know that ultimately, if, if hell lasted for a thousand years, I could stand up here today and, and go, Whew. right? There would be at least some kind of sigh of relief. We would be able to look at it and say, yes, if a soul goes to hell, it's terrible. But what would our next phrase be? It's not the end of the world, right? We, we would look at that and think, well, at least eventually or ultimately it works out or there's some relief. Um, there, there's a breath, breath of hope or a breath of life kind of at the end of that. Knowing that we aren't given that assurance, are we? We are actually told um, of that perdition being unending or lasting forever. That should be a great, great motivator and reason for us to go and to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just that their soul is eternal, but it is the place that they go to is eternal as well. Um, I, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want someone to go to the, if hell is the way the Bible describes it, and I'm sure it is because I trust God's word, but if hell is the way the Bible describes it, I wouldn't want somebody to go there for 10 minutes, Right. The, the rich man that is there in Luke chapter 16, he's in agony, both in body and in his mind. He cannot help but think of his past with Lazarus and his brothers that were still there left behind. You, you can tell that there is a, there's a torment and an agony of body, spirit, soul, and mind. Um, and just a, a passing through of Luke 16 is, is, is horrific. 
But boy, if you think that that's, if you think that that's forever, that should be a motivator for us to witness. If hell lasted a thousand years, we should probably still be a witness, but you and I both know we'd probably witness to somebody one time and think, well, I told them, um, you know, and think, well, they'll, they'll see. And then, you know, at the end, I'll tell them, see, you should have listened to me. Um, that's not how this thing works, though. Um, souls, souls are forever. Um, and we have a limited time with which to reach them in this world. What a great motivator for us. All right, and the last reason, because I think we are just about out of time here, uh, is that God has promised his blessing on those that do. Um, turn to John chapter number 4. You know, the Bible says that he that winneth souls is wise. Uh, in the book of Daniel, while you're turning to John, I'll read what it says in Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. In verse number three, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. John chapter four, verse 35, the Bible says, say not ye, there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereupon ye bestowed no labor, other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. God has promised his blessing on those that get out there and work. We are encouraged to enter into each other's labors, right? You know, in being a witness, I like what it says there in verse 36, that he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, um, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. You know, if we're going to use the analogy of sowing and reaping in a harvest in light of gospel presentation, witnessing to folks, preaching the gospel and seeing folks come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord would share with them and have them understand there's great blessing in that. There is great blessing from God in seeing that, that fruit harvested, in seeing those things come about and those things come to pass. There's great reward for he that sows, for he that reaps. One may do one job, one may do the other, but they both benefit and they both receive great blessing from the work that they each put forth and, and do and work together. We plant, we water, God gives the increase. We are thankful to know that we get to participate in that though, right? We plant, we sow, we reap. God gives the increase. God is the one that provides it, but it's great to know He's let us be part of that plan. You know, um, it's a simple plan. God, God could have chosen maybe to, to do this any other number of ways, right? Um, the idea that he would use weak men, right? Frail men, um, vessels of clay, the Bible tells us that we are. The fact that he would use us and give us opportunity to be in that work and share in the joy and in the blessing and benefit of seeing folks come to know Christ as Savior, that ought to be a great, great motivator and reason for us to be a great and better witness. I was thinking of these things and thinking of them in light of the conference that we're going to this weekend and, and a challenge for me to be, uh, I know I need to do better and I know I ought to do better. I got looking at this and thinking of some of these things. It's clear we have every number of reason to be motivated to be a good witness. If you don't, you know, we're commanded, a great responsibility, a great, great blessing. Souls are eternally valuable. That uh, There is just no reason for me not to be a great witness and to try to do better. Uh, and sharing the gospel with folks. I hope that um, you see the same things there and we can all do better about that together. Father, bless us as we dismiss today and be with us in the next.